All right, everyone, it's 2 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to kick this off with a video. Here's what you need to know about Hurricane Florence. It is shaping up to deliver disaster for days to the Carolina coast. Florence is now expected to pause right at North Carolina's coast, shift south, and pose even greater danger. Hurricane Florence is making landfall after thrashing the Carolinas all night long with devastating flooding and damaging winds. Forecasters are warning that Florence's storm surge is life-threatening and will be even worse at high tide later this morning. Hurricane Florence definitely making its presence felt. Strong winds continuing to slam into the Carolinas, but the real concern is the potential for water damage. Leave, go ahead and leave and go to find high ground because you may be in danger. This is a big, big storm. Um, so today, you guys, uh, my name is Austin Tabor. I'm the founder and CEO of Solar Support. And today we're going to go over extreme weather events and how they impact utility scale PV sites. Um, Solar Support is in the business of restoring PV sites that have been impacted by natural disasters. Um, we're also in the business of extending the life of PV utility sites. So why is this important right now? We are in the sixth consecutive year where we've had about $10 billion weather disasters. And now we're in hurricane season. So the Southeast has been, is now exposed to the upcoming hurricanes this year. So today, um, you know, at least in 2019, we have the estimated losses from extreme weather events accounted for about 50% of all the renewable energy claims in North America in 2019. This comes from G-Cube, who's gonna be on the webinar today joining us. And our goal today is to give you guys actionable insights that you can use to restore your facilities when they go offline. These include uh, plans and strategies on how to mitigate issues with your sites. Um, and this includes how to get them back up and running as fast and cost effective uh, as possible. So to start with, um, we're going to go through the speaker lineup real fast with you. My name is Austin Tabor. I'm the CEO and founder of Solar Support. Um, I have about 15 years experience in the solar industry, uh, primarily focused around PV equipment, um, site O&M services, and I held posi leadership positions at SMA, Huawei, and Jinlong Technologies prior to founding Solar Support. Um, we also have Clifford Meyer joining us. He is the Director of O&M and Restoration at DEPCOM Power. Cliff brings about another 14 years of combined experience in utility PV technology and power conversion systems. Right now, Cliff steers DEPCOM's restoration and repowering and recertification program. We have Brian Tuluki, who will be joining us as the Senior VP and Senior Underwriter at G-Cube. Brian's role involves working with clients and brokers to provide support for onshore wind and solar risks. Prior to joining GQ, Brian gained about 15 years of experience working for a number of U.S. Carri carriers focused on ensuring both traditional and renewable energy assets. Uh, finally, last but certainly not least, we have Alex Rodell. Alex is the Senior Director of Design Engineering at Next Tracker. Alex oversees the global, um, the, I'm sorry, global engineering design engineering team at Next Tracker. He has about 14 years. All right, so the video is lagging a little bit. I'm going to turn that off. Um, Alex has about 14 years in the solar industry, uh, leading engineering for companies such as SunPower and SPG Solar. And Brian's, um, let's see if I can get this on here. I'm sorry, and Alex has 15 years working in solar. He's installed about 35 gigawatts installed. He's overseen the installation of about 35 gigawatts um, across his career in the solar industry. So now we're gonna go ahead and set the stage with Brian Taluki. Brian, take it away. Thanks, Austin. For those of you who aren't familiar with G-Cube, we're a worldwide insurer of renewable energy projects with 30 years of experience with uh, focused mainly on uh, wind, both offshore and onshore, as well as solar and battery energy storage. Uh, we have four offices total, two offices in the US, one in uh, New, New York, which, in which I sit, as well as uh, Newport Beach, one in London and one in Amsterdam. So it's certainly depth of resource across the, uh, the globe. We've written 100 gigawatts of renewable energy projects insured across 40 countries. 
Um, happy to announce that we were recently acquired by Tokyo Marine HCC back in uh, late May. Um, they're backed by strong, very strong financials, A plus rated uh, according to S&P and A plus plus A and BES. We have 300 million in uh, underwriting capacity, which we can certainly deploy on any given risk, uh, any one location. We've handled over 400 claims annually, uh, with 95% of those claims uh, paid within 30 days, which is it's really a testament to the strength um, of our claims department and then their experience as well. And like this webinar, our participation on this webinar, we're happy to uh, you know, participate on seminars. We do uh, publish uh, technical publications and offer quarterly newsletters. So, so always happy to share lessons learned with our insurers and clients. Next. So here I'm just trying to paint a picture of what we're looking at in terms of what we have to consider as underwriters. And certainly there's, there's quite a bit to consider from a cat perspective. 2019 alone, we saw a polar vortex, uh, which led to certainly some ice and, and, and snow damage uh, to, to panels. Uh, we saw some heavy rainfall in the Midwest, a large hail event in Texas, which uh, GQ was on, and we paid uh, roughly 75 million uh, for that loss. Uh, we've seen a significant amount of uh, smaller earthquakes in California. We saw summer heat wave, which, which led to extra participation extra uh, precipitation and rainfall, uh, which then uh, led to flooding. And we've so certainly seen a fair, our fair share of tornadoes. So, uh, you know, and 2019 wasn't the only year in which we we saw these events. So um, it's just the latest. Uh, we, we've certainly seen a, a level of activity in, in 2020 alone. Um, so in, in, in terms of certainly uh, hail specifically, I think there's been uh, just about 3,000 events uh, in the first half of this year alone. <laughs> Next. So in terms of, um, like, I, like I alluded to earlier, it's not just, it's not just frequency. Um, you know, we're, we're equipped to handle attritional loss. Um, our book is a, equipped to handle those losses, but what we've seen recently is severity. And as you can see with the slide uh, included here is that there's certainly been an uptick through the years in terms of both frequency and severity. 2017, we had Harvey, um, Irma and Maria, which accounted for 92 billion losses uh, for the industry. California wilds, wildfires in 2017 accounted for 14 billion in, in losses. And there was an earthquake in Mexico that accounted for 2 billion in losses. 2018 was, our, uh, was the first year in which a wildfire was the most expensive industry event of the year. So we saw her, uh, California wildfire account for 16 and a half billion in losses. In um, 2018, we also saw Hurricane Florence and Michael account for over, just over 15 billion in losses. So the, the next slide I'm showing is, is just in terms of, you know, how, how negligible, you know, there, there really isn't a difference when you're looking at, at varying deductibles um, in terms of maybe potential cost savings um, across our book. It, it, our book, as you can see, there's, you know, over the last couple of years, if, if we look at this slide, there's 273 claims. Of those 273 claims, a large portion of those are, you know, fall with below 100K. Um, so, so there certainly is frequency and those attritional losses, but of the 12%, they account for roughly just about 97% of the $150 million in losses that we paid. So certainly, um, you know, severity is of great concern. If we've taken necessary steps as an industry and as a company to certainly try to mitigate CAT as best we can, um, and that's through reducing our line sizes, um, that's through capping sublimits on natural uh, perils. We're certainly increasing rates um, and we're, we're pushing significant cat deductibles where it makes sense. So that's just, uh, just you know, that's, I'm just trying to paint a picture of what we're looking at uh, from an insurance perspective and from an underwriting perspective and how the emergence of cat 
and NACAD and, and these significant events have impacted our bugs and, and forced us to take a, a different look um, in order to be a sustainable market moving forward. Now I'm gonna pass the baton back to Austin who's gonna share with us the importance of inspections post loss. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate that handoff. Um, so guys, I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through the, uh, maybe if this slide thing goes, come on, baby. There we go. All right, there's my name. All right, everyone. So uh, a little bit of a rough start. Um, so for inspection practices, you know, once you have one of these sites damaged, um, I wanna go over what we do here at Solar Support, how we mitigate the damage, how we assess it, how we document it, and then how we put a plan together to address it. Um, so first thing that happens, you know, after something comes through is you wanna get to site and figure out what is happening out there. Do you have, um, you know, do you have a safety issue? Do you have multiple modules down? Um, and then how you document it really matters. So the way we assess this damage is we assign it to about four categories. Number one is you have, you have one central inverter that's offline, not a big deal, minor production issues. Then you have minor damage where it's, you know, it's not the best. Maybe you have two inverters offline. You got maybe 10, less than 10% of the site that's been impacted um, as far as production goes. And then you have partial destruction. Partial destruction is anywhere from 10 to 50%, if I can get out of the way, 10 to 50% of the plant offline. Um, at that point, you're looking at a much larger project, and that's about where we kind of consider it into more of a deconstruction and then reconstruction facility uh, uh, plan. And if you also see, you know, you have that scenario, but then you have the worst case scenario, which is complete and utter uh, obliteration of your facility, which is a complete teardown for the most part and then rebuilding the site. All right, so what are you looking for when you assess and you put together documentation for this? Uh, well, first, if you want that maximum payout, you need to put the costs, uh, you need to put the labor costs in for that documentation. We expect about 15 to 25 percent of those labor costs are associated with documentation. Um, when you are on site and you are looking at assessing the site, you want to note every aspect. You want to take as many pictures as possible. You want to do a drone flyover um, with thermal imaging. You want to get a big broad picture of everything and you also want to get the thermal imaging to ensure if there are any hidden issues at your facility, ground faults, uh, micro cracks in the modules, you want to capture all of that. Um, and then the next really important one is walking the site. You unfortunately can't just take those drone pictures and make broad sweeping um, you know, generalizations about it. You need to walk it and physically have boots on the ground to take those pictures. Um, and specifically one of the things you want to be on the lookout for are components um, or parts that may be out of production or have very long lead times. You wanna get that ball rolling if you don't have spare parts on hand. Um, and then next, all that documentation, it really should be shared with the insurance team. Um, they're gonna have a group of adjusters and potentially subrogation experts on hand. Those guys, um, you know, while they are working for the insurance company, they are on your side and they will get you paid faster if you are transparent and share information with them. So I've got an example plan here. Um, once you have all that documentation, you need to put together a plan. Um, I've got kind of a rough outline here behind me. Um, this one over my shoulder is a facility that we restored. This is a very broad outline that you would share with the, uh, with the customer, the asset owner, asset manager, um, the insurance company, showing them that you have a plan put together that goes along with the proposal from the contractor. Um, on top of having all that pretty stuff, the other thing that you need to take into consideration is how you're going to document it all um, and execute on it. We use a third party application called ClickUp. You can use whatever you want. I had to throw it out there because it's an amazing tool. You can put together these really nice uh, Gantt charts and milestones in that system. And I promise the team I won't talk about that anymore. So um, defining a plan. So if you need to set up a plan for restoring your site, this is the overall blueprint for that. Your number one thing that you're looking for off the bat is a, a PM, a project manager or a construction manager. Um, I threw up here the honey badger. I can thank Jing Tian for this. You want to focus on having someone who is a honey badger. I'll get myself out of the way. Thank you, Chelsea. All right. So a honey badger is someone you're going to give them the responsibility. They're going to have the boots on the ground and they're going to be aggressive in getting the site back up and running as quickly as possible. They're not going to be aggressive in a mean way, but in a way of getting things done, following up, making sure nothing falls in the cracks. Next, you want to set up a system. Um, you want to be able to let the system handle any kind of reporting, 
any meetings, any milestones, and most importantly, you need forms. You need to be able to capture the progress in a standard way so that it can be shared with everyone else at the facility or at the, who's involved in the project. Next, you need a kickoff meeting. The kickoff meeting is critical to any project's success. You want to have the, all the responsible parties in there. You want the customer in there most of the time. And you want to go through all the tasks, the processes, the schedule. And then most importantly, you need to devote at least 15 to 30 minutes. And if Cliff had his way, probably two hours to talk about any kind of surprises, um, things that can go wrong, uh, any kind of solutions to those things. You have to uh, play what my kids call the what if game. Uh, I hate playing as a parent, but in these situations, you have to play the what if game in order to uh, get this done. Make sure you capture all that and put together a rough outline of your plan. Um, and then finally, you need to have that honey badger. You need to make sure that they are following through, using all the tools and systems that they set up, that they're following up on that progress, and most importantly, that they are communicating with the rest of the team. It's, it's imperative that they communicate with that team and with the asset owner, asset manager, and the insurance company. So um, speaking of equipment, we're going to go ahead and hand it over to Alex Rodell, who's going to talk about the equipment solutions over at Next Tracker and how they make a difference when it comes to um, being impacted by disasters. Take it away, Alex. Perfect. Thank you, Austin. Yeah, so my name is Alex Rodell, Senior Director of Design and Engineering at, at Next Tracker, and I've been overseeing, um, you know, solar designs for the past 14 years. And, and of course, just like all of us, and what we've showed earlier in the slides, we're starting to see a fair share of natural disasters. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and one more. Great, great. Let's, let's go ahead and play this video. And we're, we're going to start small here. And, and what we're really going to see is that we're starting to realize dynamic effects of solar trackers are really starting to outweigh those, those static ones. And in this scenario, what I always like to point out is we're looking at these boxes right now, right? The, the video may be a little bit grainy, I think, through this connection, but what you're gonna see is these boxes aren't moving around a ton, right? These, these boxes are, are sitting still. You don't have like a weather channel situation where someone's holding on to this, this umbrella and you see that tracker moving back and forth with really, really violent movements. And so when a lot of people talk about micro cracking, all these different aspects, that's what's happening to this, this tracker right here. Um, and it's happening again at, at really low wind speeds. Um, and so these wind speeds could hit a site two to six times per year. And that should really jump out at owners and asset managers. So let's up the ante and go to the next slide. So we think about the violence of, of that last one. And now let's, now let's look at this one, right? This is at a site in, in Spain. Um, and at this particular site, it's called the Cerroso winds, okay? And these winds have been known since the ancient times, okay? These winds, it's just a constantly windy site. One, one typical example in the US is in Lancaster. Lancaster is, they call it, you know, like you can see it from space if anyone's flown over that area. It's also a very frequently windy site, okay? And so what you're gonna start to see is disasters like this happening very commonly. And you look in front of you, really, really terrible, right? You have to completely rebuild this tracker. And as you, your eye goes around to the site, you look at the left, and even if you look to the right over this guy's shoulder, you're going to see these disasters are happening all over it. Um, and then as Austin was, was showing before, this is not even a catastrophic one. You know, we, we saw that, that photo on the left of, of his slide that is really, um, really looking at a, a, a whole hurricane hitting that. I believe that was in Puerto Rico and completely decimated that particular project site, right? So this is, this is really painting a picture of, of how much damage can happen. And so, you know, there was, a, there was a survey that went out before this, and it talked about uh, what is the biggest thing that, that you can do to prevent these damages. And rightfully so, I saw the biggest one was choosing the, the correct equipment. And, and at Next Tracker, we couldn't agree more. So let's go to the next slide and look at a direct comparison. So this is a particular site, you know, in Australia. Next Tracker built phase one, and then a competitor built phase two, which was literally adjacent to it. So, when you look at this, right, you think about, oh, I have someone at this solar tracker company tell me they do dynamics well. We have another one tell me dynamics well, but sometimes you're not seeing those same results in the field. And that's what we all want, right? 
I talk about, you know, whether you're, you're GQ, whether you're solar support, you know, whether you're inverter company or whatever, we're all in the business of producing power. And the best way to produce power is to get your site up and running. That's why folks like solar support, you know, all these different people to get it back up and running are, are so, so important. And what you're going to see here with the selection of the correct equipment, you're not going to see those same damages, right? Because this is the best case scenario. This is in the field. And our site, as you can see, is perfectly up and running. And this other one is, is going to be down for a while. You got to ship it out there and then uh, you have to rebuild it, et cetera. So that could be down for months. And then the big question is, you know, as we saw in that first video, how do we prevent the same thing from happening over and over again, right? How do we have that sort of long-term reliability? And so what we really need to do is in order to, to prevent re-damaging uh, the site, because actually this site, they've had three win events in, in just a year and a half, is one can really start to look at the out exterior rows, really strapping down those exterior rows and bulking them up, um, and also do a high stow strategy. It was, it was back in the day that we all thought we should, we should stow at zero degrees, but we're really realizing that is the worst place for dynamics. So by rotating over to these high angles, you're really gonna reduce the dynamics and we can always increase the foundations um, in that particular areas to prevent those same damages from happening again. So now let's look at some other aspects. If you go to the next slide, please. This is talking about flooding and, and I love this photo right here, right? Because how often can you kayak on a solar site? Not, not very often, right? Um, and what you're gonna see is, especially in Texas, right now, West Texas is a super, super popular spot for solar. And in West Texas and all of Texas, they're seeing all these extreme weather events and flooding is no different. And so what we've done at Next Tracker is we have an active system, right? We can put flood sensors in these specific areas where the flooding is gonna occur. Because like we talked about before, when we want to have a, a business of solar, we want to be producing power, right? And what I think you guys wanna notice is right next to where this guy is kayaking, we're actually stowing outside of, of the water. That's purposeful. But as your eye travels to the back, right, what you're really gonna see is on the hillside, there's no flooding. And actually those trackers are operating. They're continuing to operate. So we're, we're combining smart controls with our systems, you know, just like our phones, our everything is improving. We combine computer programming with our systems. We can really improve performance, okay? And so let's, let's go to the next slide and talk about other ways we combine technology with, with improving performance. So here's what you're gonna see is these are connected sites. Obviously, Next Tracker, you know, the leader in the US, we have more sites than this, but, but these are sort of our, our fun sites, right? Our fun sites, and I call that because these are the places that, are, that have the extreme weather, right? These are the places that are gonna keep solar support in business for, for quite some time. Um, and so in these areas, what we're seeing now is we're combining big data with solar now. Before it was really the focus was only on inverters, right? But now we're combining that with, with solar trackers. So we have all these connected systems to uh, our programming that we can share with, with ourselves. You know, we have a 24 hour support center as well as your SCADA team or your ONM team. So let's go to the next slide and talk about connectivity. Um, and so the biggest thing now is, right, we're in the COVID era. It is not easy to send someone out to site. So we have someone here who says, okay, we have an extreme weather event. We can't just hop on a plane anymore, right? So the question is, how do we even know something has happened? When we have this, this site connection, right, we can start to see issues before we even get out there. And that is so, so big in today's era, okay? And then secondly, just like your phone, right? We can push new firmware updates. We can, we can re-go back. And, and if we have flooding at a site, we can install flood sensors and have them be smart like that last photo. And, and you go to the next slide, please. And so now what we're giving you guys is visibility, right? Because the field office is great, but now we're all in this home office world. And what we're gonna see in front of you is, is our NX Navigator platform, which, which we share with our customers. And here you can see the tracker health. You can see any, any site that's down. You can manually control it, right? If we have a hurricane situation, um, we can rotate over to, to go into a, a safe stow mode. And this is really gonna help with risk long-term. 
And then another thing here is if you see on that bottom of that panel is, is a huge introduction is, is Hale stuff, okay? Um, let's go to the next slide. Hale has just been such a big conversation recently. And to be honest, we weren't even talking about a year ago. Um, this is the one that, that, that uh, GQ was, was just discussing. You know, Brian was talking about a $75 million issue. And again, as your eye travels across the site, you can just, just see the difference, right? It pulverizes it. So when we have these active controls, we're really thinking about long-term reliability, right? Because here, because we've been hooked together since, uh, you know, all the way back in 2015, we can even retroactively update these. And so to us, I, I presented at the NREL conference, which, which talks about reliability, okay? And everyone talked about insurance issues and it really a lot of it is coming from this site, right? But no one really offered a solution, okay? And, and us at Next Tracker, we luckily were at the forefront of this and we're the first ones I've seen to come up with a real solution. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So this one is, is awesome. I love this video, if, if you could play it. This is a hail cannon. And I promise you, any day you get to play with a hail cannon is, is a good day at the office. And so what, what you're seeing here is on the left, right, is a, a structure, a panel that is sort of flat or into the direction of that particular hail. And obviously, as you, as you might imagine, glass is a brittle structure. So as soon as it hits that, that panel and you get a little bit of a crack, all hell is going to break loose. That's why you saw in that last photo, certain panels are okay, certain ones are not. It's like you get a little crack on your windshield, right, and then it propagates over time, but here that the, the hail will annihilate it. But with respect to next tracker, right, we can rotate those, those trackers over, rotate those panels over during a hailstorm and really change the incidence angle of this. And as a result of that, it's been the first tracker solution through active controls, which again, you can do remotely from the click of a button from our home office. Can we really prevent these huge damages and prevent the $75 million damages that we've seen out there? So that's what we're really excited about and, and we can plan for future use and applying it back. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Cliff Myers at DEF COM to talk more about this. Great, so good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. I'm Cliff Myers, the director of 3R, or uh, simply put, restorations at DEFCOM Power. Um, I wanna start by saying thanks to everybody for joining. I was scrolling through the list earlier um, and I see a lot of familiar names. So, uh, you know, big thanks to everybody for, uh, for joining this. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of background on DEFCOM and then I wanna talk about for asset managers and owners, uh, there are a number of components that, that you can do or focus on uh, to set yourself up for success and recovering from a disaster situation. Um, so to start with, with DEPCOM, uh, we're a fairly young company. We've been, uh, been around for about six or seven years now, um, but we've been recognized as one of the fastest growing uh, businesses in the energy sector. Um, and you know, what, we're, what we're focused on is strictly utility solar development, EPC, and O&M. And so that's there on the uh, left-hand side of that slide. On the right-hand side is a business unit that we've started to pick up over the past two years, uh, which is called 3R, and that stands for Restoration, Recertification, and Repowering. And what we're doing is we found, uh, you know, we found there was a gap in the market where uh, a lot of our clients and, and other people out there were uh, um, suffering you know, extended downtime and damage from these, these events um, or OEMs that are exiting the market and products are abandoned. Uh, so we've come up with these ways to step in and, and help out. And that's, that's really the driver for this business unit. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is primarily focused for asset managers and owners. Um, I wanna give you what I see as the keys to success in recovering in a situation like this. And there's four components that I'm gonna talk about. And of course, we'll start with safety. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give a, a short story on, on a, a situation on one of the, the projects, and I'll go into um, strategic recovery. So the way that you can manage your contractors to uh, um, approach the restoration in a way that benefits you. And then, Salvaging strategies, there's a, you know, a benefit to being flexible and working with uh, the insurance company to, uh, to be fully reinstated. 
and then I'll go over contractor management, uh, a way that you can limit your risk uh, by coming up with you know, these certain agreements with your contractors. Next slide, please. Okay, so to start with safety, um, you know, what I really want to point out is in a disaster situation, uh, so when you've been impacted by a natural peril, um, and, and I want to say almost, almost every situation, hail might be the least risk, but everyone is not a normal situation. So when you send your operators out to assess the damage, you should really take a moment to pause and consider all of the threats and then mitig mitigate the risk that you can. Um, Cause these are, they're wild situations. You will see things that are energized that shouldn't be energized. Uh, you'll probably be surprised to find that, that things are running when you would expect them not to be running. Um, and then, uh, you know, also, even if you assess all the risks, there's still uh, going to be situations that, that pop up that you didn't expect. So really important to uh, spend a lot of time considering safety. And a short story that I wanted to share with you is, uh, you know, we witnessed a utility power plant where, uh, you know, there was about four feet of flooding. So the inverters were about 40% submerged. And um, from the road <laughs> where your vehicle would be, you could hear the inverters were still running. The inverters that were, you know, completely underwater. So I'm not going to say which, which OEM uh, made those inverters because the way, you know, depending on how you look at it, that could be a testament to their, uh, you know, being robust. But uh, the reason I mention that is because there's a high risk when you go out to these projects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so to talk about uh, strategic recovery, um, you know, what we focus on here at DEFCOM is what we call ownership mentality. Every time we approach a situation like this, we like to think of everything as if we own the project. What would we do if we were the owners? And that's what you should expect from your contractors. So when you're developing a plan, um, it's important to prioritize the way that you um, approach the work. So you don't necessarily want to start on, 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 a, on an area that's you know, going to be done in, in you know, two weeks and you know, only net a small amount of uh, energy. You want to focus your attention on the areas where you can impact your uh, energy recovery the most. This helps out the, uh, the owners and the PPAs, and it also helps out the insurance company with the business interruption. Um, so the next thing you want to look at is which phases can be, uh, can be done concurrently. Um, obviously, you don't want to wait and have a, uh, a linear pipeline, but at the same time, you don't want to end up in a situation where uh, you're taking things apart and you don't have the parts you need to, to put it back together. Uh, so you spend a lot of time to uh, nail down that strategy, but everybody on your team should be constantly thinking about those sort of steps. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so for salvage strategies, the, uh, the main point I want to get at here is, you know, with the insurance companies, their job is to reinstate your project. It shouldn't be a situation where you're better off or worse than you were before. So if you've got an older plant, um, you may be limited on, on your claim in certain aspects. Uh, so we encourage coming up with uh, potential salvage strategies. So for modules, there are ways that you can test to the original data sheet uh, and recover those. I, I noted photoluminescence testing to, to search for micro cracks, but uh, you can put together a really detailed plan for the criteria that would allow you to salvage certain things. Um, and then the, the next thing is uh, the ability to potentially step in and warrant the work. Uh, so in one situation, DEFCOM uh, stepped into the warranties for 10 inverters on a, uh, on a particular project. So they weren't gonna be replaced. You were gonna be without warranties, but having that flexibility the insurance company was willing to, uh, you know, to cover the cost of that. Um, and the owner was able to benefit from having the warranties continue on those products where they were revoked by the OEM. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Yep. Okay. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is contractor management. Um, and this is where 
you know, I encourage you to make sure that your contractor's interests are aligned with your interests. Um, and what I'm getting at there is you wanna manage your risk and we prefer to use lump sum bids. And the idea there is if you're paying somebody T and M, um, like it or not, there's, there's sort of a uh, motivation to not finish the project early. Um, you know, if you're, if you're only getting paid uh, by the time that, that you're out there, there's uh, an incentive to take longer. Uh, so we completely avoid that by doing a lump sum bid. We agree to a timeline. We agree to deliverables. Um, and we take the entire scope um, so that you don't have to worry about anything because that's, you know, you need to focus on the assets that, that you're taking care of or your other projects or even the remainder of the plant. And uh, your contractor should be willing to take on that scope, stand behind it, and warrant their work. Um, the next, next item down is uh, documentation control. Really important when you're working with an insurance claim. Um, well, not just for insurance claims, but in general, to maintain proper documentation and forms as Austin pointed out. Um, and then share as much detail as you can up front with your contractor to make sure they can be as accurate as possible. You also don't want to put them into a situation where they're having to issue uh, change orders uh, throughout the throughout the process. Um, and then you know the, the the note that we talked about before is the flexibility with salvage options. We try to stay extremely flexible here at Depcom, but any contractor that you work with, it's important to talk about that up front to say, hey, if we end up in this situation and there's an opportunity to salvage this or that, um, have them include that in their bid. And then the, uh, the final note that I will add is matching your electrical parameters. Um, you know, you end up in situations now where you, you have 600 volt uh, DC power plants that uh, um, are effectively obsolete. It's really hard to procure certain modules. Uh, so it's important that they are able to uh, come up with alternatives in situations like that. Uh, so that's it for me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody and I will pass the ball to Brian and he's going to talk about uh, how to streamline your insurance claims. Thanks Cliff. Next slide please. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly walk you through kind of best practices in order to best, you know, to, to streamline the claims process and hopefully mitigate potential uh, further claims in, in, in regards to business interruption, especially. So first and foremost, I think it's always best to err on the side of caution and report the claim immediately. Engage your insurer, engage your claims adjuster, make sure they're aware of the event. Um, be proactive. Partner with top tier EPCs and OEMs. I think it's I think it's always best to certainly partner with uh, a contractor that stands behind their work and is experienced and established in the space. Makes a difference, as well as manufacturers that stand behind their product and they have the warranties to back them up. Uh, spare parts network is is critically important in the event of a loss. Um, if you you know uh, what what's the availability of your spare parts? Do you keep them? Uh, are spare parts on site? Um, if they're on site and stored properly, hopefully they're in good condition. If if there are no spares, then hopefully you have a network in place uh, with your OEMs and and other critical suppliers to get those spare parts. Um, Having a critical equipment uh, contingency plan is important in the event of you know main inverter or, or transformer going down. Um, consistent communication with insurers and claims adjusters. I think it's always best to document everything as Cliff alluded to throughout the claims process and make sure that that everyone is is completely aware of um, and, you know there's full transparency throughout the claims process, and certainly. Uh, you know, in, in looking at Alex's presentation, it's pretty clear that technology does make a difference, uh, whether it's, you know, the panels or, or the trackers, uh, there's certainly technology that is more resilient in the event that there's a, you know, a, a massive hail event or a windstorm event or even a flood event to that, for that matter. Now, I did have a, uh, I alluded to this earlier, but um, GQ paid the largest uh, HAL related solar PV loss in the industry uh, back in 2019. 
Um, and, and, and while you never want to, you know, see those types of losses on your books as an insurer, I think, I think it was a real success story in terms of the claims process. Um, you know, overall the, the claim was paid and the pro the project was operational in less than six months, which is a real testament to, to not only the strength and experience of our claims team and the appointed adjuster, but also how prepared and proactive the insured was um, after the loss. And, uh, you know, just, just some of the things that they, that the insured did uh, to prevent, you know, further potential loss was they, they immediately took the site offline to prevent further damage. Um, they performed both ground and drone inspections post loss immediately. Um, they took the, uh, uh, you know, they took the site, uh, the, uh, they're, I'm sorry, they, they put back the unaffected uh, portion of the site online immediately uh, to further mitigate potential, um, you know, VI. Um, and they certainly, they had open dialogue throughout the process with, with GQ as well as the appointed adjuster. Um, finally, they, they really did well to us, you know, they had established relationships with contractors and suppliers to not only get the materials that they needed, but have the work done in a, in a timely manner. And all of that played a major role in, in this ultimately being a, a success from a client's perspective. So I, that's it for me. I'm gonna pass this back to Austin, who I think has another success story to share. Yes, thank you, Brian. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, walk you guys through how we were able to save, um, in combination with Depcom, uh, a company called Power Factor and ourselves, we were able to save about 2.5 million after Hurricane Florence. And I wanna walk you guys through this storm real quick because it was pretty intense. Um, it dumped about 34 inches of rain um, across different communities inside of North Carolina. To put that into perspective, since I didn't really know this about rain, um, the annual rainfall in Washington, D.C. is about 40 inches annually. So you're looking at almost a year's worth of water dumped in different cities across the state. The other issue with this is this thing crawled across the U.S. If you look over my shoulder here at the line, you can see it was going pretty fast. And then all of a sudden, it hit the coast and just dropped in speed to about three to six miles per hour. In combination with it being about 350 miles wide, it just brought all kinds of flooding and devastation to the site. Um, and the site we're referring to, it has uh, about 10 inverters that were just a little bit below grade compared to the rest. Um, they were power conversion stations. Um, and what happened is they were inundated with about, about uh, anywhere from 18 to 24 inches of water inside the inverter cabinet. And at that point, you know, the site had been completely uh, uh, turned off once the storm had come through, or before the storm came through, it had been isolated. The operator knew what they were doing. They had a plan put together to shut everything down. Um, and then at that point, um, we came in and the insurance company came in and they said, look, if you want to insure this site, you need to raise up these skids or come up with some other solution. Um, we went with the first solution. We said, you know, you guys are the insurance company. Um, we're going to go ahead and go with that solution. Um, we worked together with, uh, you know, ourselves, solar support. We handle all the um, uh, project management, construction management, electrical engineering. Um, and then we worked with DEPCOM and DEPCOM handles all the contract management, um, all the financing, all the insuring. And they, uh, as uh, Cliff likes to put it, they are the one throat to choke. That's who's mainly interfacing with the customer. Uh, if you have a problem, that's who, you, that's who you're just going to Bart Simpson. Um, and then we have Power Factor. Power Factors are, are boots on the ground. They are a very specialized group of individuals, electricians, uh, construction managers, supervisors. Uh, they know how to get it done, get it done quickly. They're flexible. They have a broad skill set. And I can't say enough good things about them. So we put together this plan, um, and I'm going to try and walk you guys through it. I'm going to turn my video off real quick so you can see. Uh, stage one, it's really simple. We're just lifting this skid up off the ground, unbolting it. I'm sorry, we're unbolting it first, determining all the AC and DC connections. Then we lifted up the PCS, exposing the, all the inputs there at the bottom. Then we built the uh, vault. We actually used uh, concrete masonry blocks to build a vault. We poured some pedophor some footers too. But we put this vault together. Um, and we were going to complete the MV circuit so we could re-energize the site, um, but I'll talk about some delays that happened uh, that affected that. And then the plan was to set this back down on top of the vault, extend the MV connections, extend the DC connections, and finally uh, fix the fiber. So remember earlier when I talked about surprises and challenges. 
Um, well, we had quite a few of those. And one of those, just as an example, was completing that MV circuit. We had, uh, we were running up against the BI deadline and we had about, um, we had five weeks total to get this done. And we had about two weeks worth of delays that were impacting the site. And we were able to get this done within three days of the BI interruption claim um, coming to fruition. So what does that all mean? Well, we were able to save about 1.3 million um, in business interruption savings. Um, compared to the, uh, the alternatives that were out there, we got this done about 152 days faster and at about 60% uh, more competitive advantage compared to the alternative. Total savings for this was about 2.5 million. Um, so there was, it makes a big difference. Sorry about that. It makes a big difference who you choose for your restoration projects. It, it's, it's imperative to have a plan put together um, so that you can be prepared when something like this happens and then making sure that you have the right team um, in your phone book so that you can get a site back up and running as quickly as possible. So that concludes our, uh, our webinar for right now, at least the main presentation. We now have the questions and answers section. Um, I see a lot of people have submitted questions. Um, I'm gonna try and get to as many of these as I can. And we'll see if we can tee some of these up too. Um, I'm gonna go with the first one I see up here. Uh, this is from Kyle Herman. Does solar support supply o and technicians to assist with the repairs? We primarily focus on um, providing instruction, uh, project management. Uh, we do have a team that can go out there and do things like that sometimes, but uh, typically it's subcontracted. All right, let's see if we can find one for someone else. Um, Alex, I'm gonna tee this one up to you. This is from Richard Davis. He says, some US locations can be exposed to very severe hail. Is there any consideration to using thicker tempered glass that could withstand that? Yeah, that'd be great, right? Um, I think, the problem is the way the module industry is going and people are familiar with it, the glass is actually thinning. And that's maybe why you see more issues with hail these days than you would have several years ago. Um, of course we want to do that, but, but for us, regardless of how thick the glass is, remember if it just barely hits and makes a crack, it, it's, it's going to be worsened for that particular panel. So we still see that at the highest angle possible is the best way to get around it. Uh, absent of, of the glass. And I want also people to realize uh, that there's been a lot of more studies on this. There's an RETC white paper that you guys are welcome to reach out to me either on LinkedIn or, or via email and under NDA we can share that that talks so much about this hail still because I know that's a huge topic. But yes, of course, glass will, thicker glass will help, but also so will a high angle still. Thank you very much, buddy. All right, uh, Cliff, I'm gonna tee this one up to you. This uh, says that you mentioned, this is actually should be my question, but I, I love your voice, Cliff. All right, you mentioned that the documentation process was like 15 to 20% of the labor cost for the project. What in your view is the single most important documentation the asset operators can pull together to get the most insurance payout? Boy, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's all about uh, finding documentation to get the highest payout. It's, it's really about making sure you have all, all the documentation to receive your payout. And, and what I mean is as you go through this process, you should be agreeing with your contractor to a full scope where they're going to provide all of the engineering drawings, the stamps, the um, the changes to the plant, they'll do all of the RFIs with the OEMs. Um, and then all of the work that they need to do has to be documented in a way that you can be reimbursed or uh, um, you can properly account for how that money was, uh, was spent. Uh, so that's the, the documentation that we're talking about. And I'll, I'll kind of tie it to a, a story that I just heard the other day from one of our clients. I personally haven't experienced this. But uh, what they shared with me is one situation where uh, it was an insurance claim for them. The insurance company wanted them to account for every single water bottle that was drank. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can determine whether or not that, that's, that's accurate, but, but I get the, uh, uh, the motivation behind it. Uh, that's the way it feels. They, it, it's, in, it's critical to have everything documented, every piece of work that's done, serial numbers, um, and so it's, it's really helpful to have a dedicated team to do that for you. Otherwise, it'll, it'll really take a toll on your resources. Thank you very much, Cliff. Um, Brian, this one's for you. 
Brian, you mentioned that technology makes a difference in terms of panels and trackers. Does tech have an impact on premium when you're underwriting a risk? It's a really good question um, and certainly something uh, that's come up quite a bit recently. Um, I, the short answer is no. Uh, we're, I don't think we're there yet. I think we need more evidence, um, real-time evidence, uh, real-life data to, 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 to kind of go move in that direction. I think what you might see from us is, is that maybe down the road, you know, if we are entertaining a risk in, a, in, a, in an area that's more exposed to uh, natural cap perils, that, you know, we might set a standard as far as you need, you know, uh, this type of equipment, or we're looking for this in terms of your trackers, this in terms of your panels, that sort of thing. But we're not there yet in terms of pricing, that's for sure. Thank you, Ron. All right, I'm gonna talk about this next one. It talks, uh, this is, hi Austin, can you talk about documenting damage? Some people use drones for aerial image, others talk about thermal imaging. Can you weigh in with recommendations for what owners should be asking for to help with the insurance process? Um, yes, I, it's, <laughs> I talked about selecting a honey badger. Typically that honey badger has someone who has a lot of experience in the field and um, they can kind of split that difference between um, you know, being a field hand, knowing what it's like in a construction environment and also being in the back office and communicating and giving presentations and things like that. So you want someone to actually go out there who knows what they're doing. Um, you wanna make sure this is someone you trust, someone who's responsible um, and let just give them free reign. I mean, typically you're gonna have a plan put together hopefully, but you wanna let them go to site and let them tell you what's wrong with the facility. Um, and that can be a combination of, you know, people on the ground with cameras and phones, um, drones for the aerial images, and then any kind of testing that may be needed. Um, but let them, let them get to work, let them do what they're doing. That's probably the best thing you could possibly do. All right. All right, uh, who should I throw this one to? I'm gonna throw this one out there and whoever wants to answer it can, uh, can jump in on this. Can the restoration and recovery process uh, that was described be applied to commercial size systems, 100 kilowatt to three to four megawatts? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, yeah, I, I think absolutely it, it can be applied and, and it should be, uh, especially the safety aspect. Um, so same scenario there, whichever contractor you're working with, uh, you've got to make sure that they uh, hopefully have experience in restoration work because this isn't something that uh, you just walk into and say, hey, I'm going to know everything that's going on out there. It's not, not a normal uh, situation. Uh, but after that, the same, same processes apply. There's the potential for uh, salvaging when you're going through the reinstatement with the uh, insurance company. Um, and then there's the potential to prioritize your, uh, your energy uh, recovery, uh, which actually on that note, I think there was another question about that. You know, what can asset managers do um, uh, to help do that? But, uh, you know, I think it, it, it starts with taking a look at your plant and uh, uh, where the damage is. So you assess it at a high level and pick out the areas that have the biggest impact, the longest lead times. Um, and it really, to be honest, it, it doesn't take a lot of time to prioritize uh, the work. So it could be you know, an hour, hour or two meeting with your team uh, to drill down into uh, how you're going to approach it. Uh, but I think it starts with setting, uh, setting that meeting up or setting the tone for, for approaching a project that way. Um, anyway, great, great question. And I see one here, Austin, I hope you don't mind me stepping in, but I'm going to throw one to uh, Alex, because I'm, I'm curious as well. It says, uh, how are hail events detected in real time? It sounds like it requires a manual signal to stow. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so right now it is manual. Of course, it's manual remotely. You can either have someone on site, you would have your own O&M team, or you can have our team, of course, do it, who, who are watching you know, their asset, watching the weather and stuff. But this is, this is what's key. Because we're connected, right, we're always progressing forward. So right now, we actually have a solution with the click of a button instead of going out there and trying to rotate every single one. What's exciting is that our company, we have just as many software engineers on the R&D side as we do mechanical and structural. So we are working on active controls. We're not there yet. But we can apply that to all of our sites retroactively. And that's you know something like 20 gigawatts in, in the US. 
So at some point, we're going to be able to push our firmware and really get to that active detection mode. But yes, right now, remotely, it is a click of a button. Thank you, Alex. Um, I want to take another one of these questions real quick because I think this one's really important. We've got about uh, five minutes left. Um, you mentioned that the document pro documentation process was 15 to 20 percent of the labor costs for the project. What, in your view, is the single most important documentation that asset operators can pull together to get the most insurance payout? Um, your initial inspection, when you first get to the site and you start going through it and basically choosing things that are like, okay, this is damaged, this is damaged, this is damaged, here's the pictures for that, that's the most important part. Like it's, it sounds trivial, but you need to look at the asset as for what it is. It's an asset and everything on there basically has a price tag. You need to go through it step by step and, and basically say, this is why this is damaged. This is the issue with it. I, this is the person who inspected it. This is all the information they collected on it. If you don't have that, um, I've worked with some of the adjusters and they are very detail oriented. And, and Brian, you can, you can attest to this as well, I'm sure they will notice small changes and details or um, incongruencies in the data. And, and Brian, can you talk about that a little bit, how that works? Sure, yeah, you know what? I, I mean, I'd probably leave that to our, to our claims personnel uh, specifically to, to address those questions. But I know um, certainly that they're very thorough on their process and, and work closely with the claims adjusters um, and, and the insureds um, on a daily basis when, you know, in, in the event of a claim. Um, but, you know, if, if you're interested in, in more data uh, to, to, you know, in, in relation to that question, uh, happy for anyone to reach out to me and I can certainly pass them um, on to our claims team. I'm gonna take one last question. Alex, this is for you. For any decentralized tracker, typically one to 2% of rows are not operational at any given time. What happens when a hurricane hits and some of the rows cannot move into stow position? Yeah, that's that's a difficult scenario, right? Because if something is stuck, you you can't get it rotated over. You're you're gonna be you're gonna be screwed. You know that's 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 a tough portion, and it's not just decentralized trackers though. It's it's also being connected. You know because in those decentralized trackers, you could go out there and physically rotate them with with some sort of device, but also if you're not connected you're not gonna be able to go out in time, especially in the COVID era. And, and like, look at this, look at this photo in front of us. There's hundreds, if not thousands of trackers. There's just not enough time. So for us, whether you're decentralized or not, if you're not a connected tracker, you're honestly, you're not a 2020 tracker. You're, you're, you're passive, right? Because if we're gonna be successful for these years to come, these design lives of 30, 35, 40 years, we need to keep pushing these updates. Um, so that's that's what's key. We, of course, believe that decentralized trackers are the way to go, but also really connected trackers. And that's the best way to reduce your risk. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that's it for our webinar today, you guys. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing it with us in this presentation. There are some more um, questions here. We're going to go ahead and answer those by email for everything that we didn't answer here on this webinar. Um, Thank you for watching. Please take our survey if you have any questions. Um, I believe our entire team here can be reached on LinkedIn and I'll get out of the way so you can actually see the contact information. And thank you again. Thank you to our speakers, our guests, Alex Rodell, Clifford Myers, Brian Tyluki. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and to have a good rest of the week. Thanks everybody. Thank you.